Okay, we've covered China and its neighbors, the worlds of Christendom, and now we're going to cover the worlds of Islam, um, fragmented and expanding. So one of the biggest things for us to note is the Ottoman Empire. Um, that is going to end up taking over the Byzantine Empire. Uh, the economy is largely agricultural. And trade was kind of the big deal there. Um, they were domestic. They wanted control of all of the import-export of precious metals, cotton, and wheat. Um, so they're going to kind of try to control that in the trade routes. Um, they were Islamic in culture, but basically they also incorporated different um, parts of Judaism and Christianity, Greek, Persian, and Arab art was also seen in the Ottoman court. So they're going to have a lot of kind of a mixture of religion, not just one solid religion, which is pretty cool. So this is Mehmed II. He is going to strengthen the Ottoman, the Ottoman Navy and make preparations to attack Constantinople. And remember, Constantinople becomes Istanbul. At its height, the Ottoman Empire spanned three continents and covered what we now know today as Turkey, Egypt, Greece, Bulgaria, Romania, Macedonia, Hungary, Israel, Palestine, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, and several other regions in Arabia and North Africa. It was one of the largest and longest lasting empires in history, spanning from about 1299 CE all the way to 1922. Today, few remnants of the once mighty empire remain, largely centralized in Turkey. But how did the Ottoman Empire rise to power in the first place? Originally, the eastern region of the Mediterranean where the Ottoman Empire flourished was actually under the control of the Roman Empire, specifically the Eastern Roman Empire, also called the Byzantine Empire. After Western Rome fell in the 5th century, the Christian Byzantine Empire struggled to keep up in the face of rapidly spreading Islam. This followed the Golden Age of Islam, which lasted from around the 8th to the 13th century. Around the 14th century, a tribal leader named Osman Ghazi, or Osman I, came to control a small principality just south of the Black Sea. Although small, the region Osman controlled was also primed for the spread of Islam, with Islamic fighters hoping to overcome the weakening Christian Byzantine. And while Osman never saw the fruition of his efforts while he was alive, his military continued to expand under subsequent leaders, growing the empire and eventually culminating in one of the most important military conquests in history, the fall of Constantinople. In 1453, the Byzantine Empire was on its last legs and barely holding territory outside of its capital, Constantinople. Meanwhile, the Ottoman Empire had spread throughout the Mediterranean region. By some accounts, roughly 100,000 to 150,000 Ottoman fighters descended on roughly 10,000 defenders of the Byzantine capital. There would have been more defenders, but the Black Plague had just swept through and decimated Constantinople's forces. After less than a two-month siege, the capital was overrun, and the Byzantine Empire, along with the Roman Empire, finally collapsed forever. Constantinople was quickly converted into the new capital of the Ottoman Empire and was colloquially renamed as Islambul, meaning full of Islam. And in fact, one of the biggest reasons for the empire's continued growth was the massive influence of religion. Besides being united by the concept of conquest in the name of Islam, also called Jihad, the Ottoman Sultan was considered a protector of Islam, as was the empire itself. With such a strong religious backing, as well as a massively powerful slave-based army, few other forces were able to compete or defend themselves. The Ottomans were also great at forming unlikely alliances, both across religious and ideological lines. One such alliance paired the empire with France, as they both opposed the Austrian House of Habsburg. The alliance proved beneficial to both, as they supported each other in their conquests of Nice, Corsica, and Hungary. This has been called the first non-ideological diplomatic alliance of its kind between a Christian and non-Christian empire. By the 16th century, the empire had spread to more than 15 million people and roughly 2 million square miles, led by Suleiman the Magnificent, the Ottomans' longest reigning sultan. The empire controlled the Mediterranean Sea, as well as Southeast Europe, Western Asia, the Caucasus, and North Africa, thus serving as the perfect melding of Eastern and Western cultures and acting as an intermediary for both sides of the world. Through endless military determination, a single family line of rule for centuries, and a highly centralized system of government, the Ottoman Empire was able to grow from a few miles of principality into one of the largest and most influential empires in history, 
but its superiority didn't last forever, and not long after its peak, it began a slow and steady decline, eventually resulting in the turbulence for which we now know the Middle East region. We'll tell you all about that in another video chronicling the fall of the Ottoman Empire. If you're a fan of innovative storytelling, you should check out Seeker VR. Our okay, and so this kind of gives you an idea. Suleiman the Magnificent is going to be one of the biggest and most important people in his expansion of the Ottoman Empire. So his dad was Salim the Grim. That's what I, he was a horrible person who killed literally everyone who questioned his power, except for apparently his son. Um, he was just not a good person. Everybody feared him. He did not do things for the betterment. Well, I guess he probably thought it was for the betterment of his country, but he was more like a power hungry kind of person. And so then when he died and Suleiman took over, everybody was terrified that this guy was going to be like his dad. And they're like, oh no. And he comes in and he's like, I love art. He wrote, he's like wrote lots of poetry. Um, and he wasn't like his dad at all. And so Everybody was like, oh, cool. This is going to be great times. Some people tried to take advantage of him to when he quickly and abruptly let them know that he did have some of his father in him. And he did murder a few people just to let them know, look, I'm, I'm a nice guy, but do not cross me. And so he kind of made everything very prosperous. One of the most important things that Suleiman did was that he was religiously tolerant. And what you're going to see is when these people are religiously tolerant, they have empires that just seem to get along. Interesting, when you kind of just agree to accept other people and everybody gets along, it's nice to see how they progress um, because they don't have anything to fight over. They're all working together. Just kind of a nice thing to see. Unfortunately, the Ottoman Empire does collapse. The Ottoman Empire was one of the longest lasting empires in modern history, spanning from 1299 CE to 1922. But after its meteoric rise throughout Europe, spreading Islam and bridging the Eastern and Western worlds, the empire slowly deflated and collapsed. Ultimately, some of the worst geopolitical situations we've seen in the past century can all be linked to the fall of the Ottoman Empire. So what contributed to this steady collapse? Well, at its peak in the 16th and 17th centuries, the empire covered more than 15 million people and about 2 million square miles throughout the Mediterranean Sea, as well as Southeast Europe, Western Asia, the Caucasus, and North Africa. But the spread of the empire upset neighboring Western European powers, which saw the Islamic empire as encroaching on their own conquests. In particular, the House of Habsburg was one of their most aggressive rivals, and the two fought a series of wars in the 16th through 18th century. The most important of these wars was the Second Siege of Vienna in 1683. The Ottomans attacked the Austrian city for a period of two months, while Poland and the remaining Western Holy Roman Empire cooperated to fend off the invaders. Eventually, Austrian and neighboring forces overwhelmed the Ottoman army, finally stopping their advance through Europe. The defeat was so great that within years, the Ottomans were also pushed out of Hungary and Transylvania and forced the empire to stop expanding throughout Central Europe via the Treaty of Karlowitz. This first major concession marked the beginning of the end. After being forced into peace throughout the 18th century, the Ottoman military lost ground, both geographically and morally, against their European counterparts. Seeing their power waning, the Ottomans instituted strict reforms known as Tanzimah, which encouraged empire-based nationalism and equality among the vast diversity of Ottoman citizens. Although the remaining regions became stronger and more unified, the empire as a whole continued to shrink. In the early 20th century, the First World War provided an opportunity for the Ottomans to reclaim their lost territory. So in 1914, they joined with the European Central Powers against the Allies, consisting of Britain, France, and Russia. Although the Central Powers had some early victories, including the collapse of the Russian government in 1917, by the following year, the Allies had overwhelmed their opponents and won the war. British troops occupied the Ottoman capital of Constantinople, and the entire empire was ceded to the Allies, who partitioned it away so it could no longer threaten Western power in the region. This geographical carving significantly increased the participation of countries like Britain and France in colonizing and occupying regions of the Middle East, and gave rise to what we now know as the modern Arab world. What little was left of the Ottoman Empire was ultimately consolidated as the Republic of Turkey. The effort to split a once unified empire along almost arbitrary borders created significant conflict between the new states and regions. 
One example was the British government's support of a Jewish homeland to be established in Britain's recently acquired territory of Palestine, a move which today has created a considerable amount of conflict and strife. Another example saw France acquiring the region of Syria and Lebanon, which created a number of smaller states with arguably incompatible populations, such as Sunni and Shia faiths. Today, the long-term result of Western powers taking over the former Ottoman Empire have led to a huge number of unexpected consequences. Although it was an extremely long-lasting empire and fell less than a century ago, today its former glory is more of a memory. And if you want to know how the empire grew to be so large and how it maintained its hold for so long, you can watch the... Okay, so that gives you an idea on how it collapsed. Remember, it ends up collapsing right after World War I. Um, this is an, an example of what a Seljuk tile is. So these are the Turks. This was a Turkish tile. Um, and this is some of the artistic achievements of the Muslims that they had all of these beautiful creations. And this is actually something that you can still see um, in a palace that was built as a summer residence for a sultan. Um, they have inscriptions from the Quran on here. It's just, it is a kind of a beautiful piece of art. And again, a lot of times what we end up seeing is we end up seeing culture as a big part of that. So let's look here. Here is the Islamic world right here in the purple. Um, the expansion of the Islamic world, you can see where it starts to expand by 1300, then 1300 to 1500. So you could kind of see the expansion of the Islamic world. Now, when it comes to religion, we've seen this before, but let's look at this again now, knowing religion a little bit more. Hinduism is first. We see it shift. We see Judaism. Now remember that Judaism, Christianity, and Islam all consider Abraham as their founding father. Siddhartha Gautama is born. Christianity spreads everywhere in Europe. Muhammad is born in Mecca. And then Islam spreads very rapidly. Discovery begins, you see Christianity come to the Americas. Now, they're not going to be the only ones that come to America. You're also going to see uh, a Hindu base that comes to the Americas as well. Then the partition of Africa is going to begin where they partition it between Christianity and Islam. I thought of that as political. So that's kind of our reminder of religion and how it spread. And remember that religion is so important. Um, cultural encounters in India and Spain are also going to be important. Um, the spread of Muslim faith is going to end up partly happening because of what is called Dev Shirmi. And that is where, um, oops, wrong one, sorry. That is where, um, the Muslims take in the Christian boys and have them fight with them. Um, some of these Christian boys would grow up and become high ranking officers 
Um, but this was kind of like stealing young Christian boys to become Muslim fighters. Uh, so that's basically what the Deb Shermi was. Um, Hindu states are going to be basically a huge egalitarian society. Remember, egalitarian means equal. So basically men and women, same, like same job, same opportunities. That is what an egalitarian society would be. Um, so why is this going to be attractive? Why would somebody see that as attractive? Well, um, in the Muslim faith, women do not have necessarily, well, depending on what time of the Muslim faith. Originally, they had um, a lot more going for them until, um, I cannot think of his name off the top of my head, but um, not Akbar, but the other one. Uh, it starts with a B. It'll come to me um, when he comes in and creates sh uh, Sharia law. So, but basically a lot of people see uh, Islam as attractive and because they are allowed to have um, more opportunities. Buddhists are going to want to convert. Why would a low caste Hindu want to convert? What is the caste system? So the caste system is in India where it is primarily Hindu. And remember the caste system, you were born into that. So you can't even get out of it. Like you're stuck there. So what would be something that you would look at as being attractive? Well, if you thought you had a way of getting out of it, then that would definitely be something that would encourage you to want to leave it. Um, so you're going to see basically the South of Delhi is going to remain Hindu, but you're going to see a big divide otherwise at the Northern section of India. That's going to come into play over and over again. Um, al Andalus is the name uh, for Spain, according to Muslims, Christians, um, Muslims and Jews are basically going to practice freely amongst each other, which is kind of interesting. Um, it doesn't happen easily, but it does happen for a little, happen for a little bit. And you're going to have this cultural syncretism that is going to be amazing. Unfortunately, it does not last. Christians are going to reconquer Spain and they're basically, um, as Christians, they unfortunately were second class citizens during the time, but they did end up reclaiming Spain. So here is, um, an Islamic scholar, kind of their, their scholars at work. You can see a little bit of the dress, more, got some Western dress going on there. So this is right here, Turkey, Anatolia, and then to finish us off, well, hey there, and welcome back to Heimlich History. In this video, we're going to be looking at state building and Dar al-Islam, which, when being translated, means everywhere Islam is. What we're going to see is that the religion of Islam created a nice little petri dish out of which empires in different parts of the world grew up. So in the mid-8th century, a new Islamic caliphate came to power in North Africa and the Middle East, known as the Abbasid Caliphate. It was big, it was powerful, it was united by the Arabic language and Islamic traditions, but the political reality of the Islamic State, not to be confused with the Islamic State, was was fractured and breaking down, but the religion itself was still vital and spreading all across Afro-Eurasia. But even as the power and influence of the Abbasid Caliphate began to wane, political Islam was flourishing in other parts of the world. So let's look at two different test cases about how political Islam encountered other cultures and how they responded. First, India, or in AP speak, South Asia. So right around the 13th century, some newly converted Muslims who also happened to be Turkish invaded India. Now it's important to know that these folks were Turks because they became the third major people group to be a carrier of Islam after the Arabs and the Persians. A long story short, they ended up establishing a Muslim political state in India called the Delhi Sultanate in 1206. Now, remember, we're thinking about how cultures responded to Muslim influence, and in India, they had kind of a rough time. Now, you may remember that Indians for a long time had been Hindu, and Hinduism as a cultural phenomenon had structured Indian society for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And therefore, the Islam of these Turkish invaders didn't gain much of a foothold. And this is pretty remarkable since Muslims were the ones who were in power in most of northern India. So let me stop here and do a quick comparison between Hinduism and Islam to help you understand why when most Indians saw Islam, they said, nah. Islam is monotheistic, which means that they worship one God and furthermore, that only one God exists. Hinduism, on the other hand, was fantastically polytheistic, which means they believed in the existence of many gods. 
A key tenet of Islam is the absolute prohibition against representing Allah in any form. Hindus generated endless statues of their gods. Muhammad taught the social equality of all Muslims. Hinduism separated society into a rigid caste system whose hierarchical levels were impenetrable by those of different castes. So you can see that converting the mass of Indian society to Islam was about as likely as an Eastern Orthodox bishop using unleavened bread for the Eucharist. <laughs> History joke, who's with me? <laughs> Whatever, I'll high-five myself. It was a good joke. Anyway, the point is, even though Muslims were in power, they found it exceedingly difficult to convert the Indian culture en masse. But there were some notable exceptions. There was a group of Muslim missionaries known as the Sufis. These folks embraced a form of Islam that emphasized more emotional and ecstatic experience, and as such, it became a more popular form of Islam. Furthermore, Sufi holy men were willing to accommodate Hindu gods and religious festivals. And there was a small population of Hindus who found all of this very attractive and were therefore converted. And most of the Indians who were converted were either disillusioned Buddhists or those who belonged to the lowest caste and as a result had a very difficult life. For them, Islam's promise of egalitarianism, or equality, was all that they needed to become believers in Allah. Okay, so that's how India responded to the military and religious invasion of the Muslims. Let's go over to West Africa for our second test case. In West Africa, Islam spread not by military conquest, but by the commercial enterprises of traveling merchants. And so as these merchants began to explain the tenets of Islam, people in West Africa converted on a voluntary and peaceful basis. Primarily, conversions occurred in the great urban centers of West Africa, like Ghana and Mali in Songhe. And under these circumstances, Islam spread like mad. And also in this region, Islam spread to the highest levels of government. In fact, the ruler of Mali, a guy by the name of Mansa Musa, went on the Hajj, which is to say the pilgrimage to Mecca, and when he did, a great retinue accompanied him, carrying magnificent displays of his wealth. So the point of all this is that between India and West Africa, there were very different responses to the spread of Islam. Now, those are only two examples, and we could go through many others. But instead, I'm going to take a hard right and talk about the economic, cultural, and technology technological innovations that the Muslims brought with them into every culture they found themselves. First, economics. Muslims, influenced by the teaching of Muhammad, thought highly of merchants and commercial activity. And as such, Muslims were some of the most dominant players in the Afro-Eurasian trade network. And in doing all of this buying and selling, they came up with a few economic innovations that are worth mentioning. For example, they came up with new forms of banking and the granting of credit and the writing up of business contracts. And soon, these innovations became commonplace among all the networks of exchange. Second, technology. Muslims made improvements on rockets, which of course they got from the Chinese. You see, the Chinese figured out that you could use gunpowder not only in pyrotechnic displays and fireworks, but you could also blow people up with it. The Muslims took it one step further and figured out how to launch rockets at ships with much greater accuracy. And here's the big lesson of world history. There's always more ways to blow people up. Additionally, the Muslims also advanced the Chinese technology of paper making. And the result of these innovations is that bureaucrats and kingdoms across the world could tighten their grip over their people's lives because the more you can write down, the more you can hold people accountable for. Third, let's look at culture. Muslims were fastidious about translating the great works of Greek philosophy and natural science into Arabic. They translated medical texts, scientific texts, philosophical texts. And therefore, the Muslim not only preserved these ideas, but went on to innovate and expand upon them. In fact, in 830, the Abbasid Caliph al-Mamun established what he called the House of Wisdom in Baghdad, which became an academic center for learning and research and translation for the next few centuries. So that's what you need to know about state building in Islam. Nailed it. All right, thank you for watching. I hope you found this useful and you learned something. If you did, hit the like button. And if you're not part of this community already, then click the subscribe button and come along. I'll see you next time. Okay, so that is the worlds of Islam. And then our next lecture section will be civilizations of the Americas.